Reliable. In this building, the highest I've seen was Caravan on weekends. Someone rented for like twelve fifty a night. Nice. So we're talking, yeah. you know, you're making half of what you think you're gonna get in gross rents in one evening. What's up, guys? It's Adam Martin here. Matt McKeever and I drove down to Toronto today to meet with Emma, and she's gonna talk to us a little bit about the condo game in Toronto. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself. My name's Emma Pace. I work with Zucasa Realty downtown Toronto. I specialize in the condo market. I've been doing it for the last three and a half, four years. So I'm gonna give you guys all the tips and tricks that I possibly can today uh, and keep this guy a little bit more up to date in terms of what's going on downtown here. Guys, I don't know a single thing about Toronto's real estate market right now other than it scares the hell out of me. So what I'm really interested in is can you make money here? Is, does it make sense to invest in Toronto or are we just betting on the greater fool strategy? Um, a little bit of both sometimes I think uh, in terms of investing I think uh, Airbnb is probably like the best opportunity in terms of cash flow downtown for condo owners right now if you want to buy specifically for investment it can be very difficult to break even let alone cash flow if you're buying with call it 20% down on a $500,000 condo so even if you have a hundred grand cash you're probably still looking at like three to five hundred dollars a month out of pocket. Wow. Um, and everyone thinks the the rental market is, I mean the rental market is insane. Not everyone thinks like it truly yeah. is insane. We're probably looking at like two thousand and maybe twenty two hundred dollars a month for a one bedroom condo right now. Upwards of three thousand bucks a month for two bedrooms. So you know if you have something really small uh, maybe 2600 but between 2600 and 3000 bucks a month for, for rents downtown right now. But I mean, your carrying cost on a $500,000 condo with 100 grand down is about 2600 bucks a month approximately. So if you're looking to buy uh, your first condo, 2600 bucks a month, if you've got a 20% down payment, is kind of like what you can expect for monthly costs kind of out of pocket. So flipping back to Airbnb, a one bedroom condo on Airbnb will typically gross you about 3,500 bucks a month, potentially a little bit more, give or take. So you're looking at about 900 bucks a month cash flow if you're doing the management uh, yourself. Um, and if you're doing the management and the cleanings yourself, you're looking at probably another maybe 200 bucks or 300 bucks in cleaning fees that you'll collect. So I think that's kind of like the best opportunity. You yeah. can get some good cash flow monthly, but like you have to strategize properly to do it. For sure. And are there specific locations that work best for that? I mean, we're kind of near Fort York and my understanding of Toronto is very bleak, but thankfully we've got the CN Tower here to kind of guide us. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, there's going to be different landmarks that are going to attract uh, different guests when you're doing kind of the Airbnb thing. Yeah. Um, but I think realistically, if you're anywhere kind of in the downtown core, most people who are coming from outside of Toronto and not knowing it would be kind of happy staying anywhere downtown. I'm in Fort York right now. There are a couple condos here that exclusively do allow Airbnb. Just a side note regarding Airbnb, there's kind of like two different ways that buildings can do it or three different ways. One, they just don't let it happen at all, which is most condos down here. Two, it can be written in a condo declaration that short-term rentals are actually like permitted down here. Right. Um, so in my building, it says in the foundational paperwork of this condo that we're always allowed to do short-term rentals. Wow. Well, that's something to look out for if you're buying a condo. It's, it's absolutely you. something to look out for. I'd say most con like. Most condos do not allow that. This building specifically does allow that. Yeah. So the the opportunity for someone to overturn that here is like almost next to nothing. So yeah. we had our corp lawyer come in and do sort of like a, a town hall meeting for everyone here. And basically what he was saying was if we wanted to overturn any rules of the condo declaration, we'd have to get an 80% vote of the owners in here wow. to overturn it. And yeah to say like, hey, we want to switch it over to long-term rentals only or a certain like 30 day minimum or whatever. Yeah. But the 20% of people who bought in this condo specifically because they were like, we are allowed to do short-term rentals in here, yeah. could sue the condo corp. Yeah. And nine times out of 10 would actually win. Yeah. So. Well, just cause it's a breach, right? Like, yeah, you're basically. This is why I bought yeah, here. There's very, yeah, there's very little that you could do to overturn it. And I think that, I mean, even getting an 80% owner vote extremely difficult like yeah. one getting a hold of all these owners you know most buildings downtown i would say if you look in the the status certificate which i'm sure we'll talk about in a bit yeah um we'll try and show you how many units are or how many units are registered with the 
with the property managers in terms of being rented. Yeah. And it's usually like a 50% rental amount, right? So if I look at a wow. status certificate, it will usually say like, there's 500 units, yeah. 236 are registered with the with the property managers being yeah. rental, uh, rented. So the likelihood of getting a hold of all of those 236 owners yeah, and getting a vote to say, hey, we want to overturn it, like it's really slimmed it on in terms of overturning that. Right? Yeah, it's impossible. So yeah, I think that you know there's a couple buildings downtown. Most of the Tridel, like Tridel is a massive builder downtown. They're one of the best known. Most of their buildings do permit short-term rentals. I'm not sure if it's in the declaration or not, but most of their property managers do allow. Subject to change, obviously. If you're looking for Airbnb, like I would, I would start with couple buildings uh, in this neighborhood and, and Tridel and whatnot. So what else brought you to this neighborhood though? I mean, what's special about right here as opposed to any of these? You know, from right here I can see, I don't know, it looks like hundreds, maybe thousands of big skyscrapers to me. Yeah, like, yeah. Why here? So, I mean, I'm kind of the type of investor I like to look for uh, underutilized opportunities that almost have a guarantee behind them that something is going to change. So when I purchased in this neighborhood, um, they had just brought in uh, Starbucks, they had just brought in, t there's like three major brands that were here and nothing else, but they had plans for like the biggest lot was in Canada is coming to the corner there, but it hadn't even started construction yet, but the plans were already implemented. So I kind of looked for, hey, I'll struggle through the next three years of not having a grocery store close to me, and uh, waiting for this development to come in. And now that the construction has started, I'm starting to see people like pile into Big this neighborhood, demand. right? So it was uh, an excellent opportunity for me at that time to yeah. basically go into a, a you know, underserved or underutilized kind of neighborhood that was like cool concrete jungle, but no infrastructure in it. Um, and then wait it out for the infrastructure to come in. So I like that from here. And you get typically a little bit of a lower price per square foot. As soon as we cross like the train tracks there above Fort York, there can be like a $200 uh, per square foot differential, just because you're technically like 750 meters yeah. maybe or something maybe. like that, like half a kilometer. Maybe. Uh, because we're half a kilometer closer to the downtown core, it instantaneously spikes because you're in the entertainment and like restaurant road district. So I think that, you know, there's a couple neighborhoods like um, over kind of like on King East right now, that's, they're more up and coming neighborhoods. I like those from like a long-term hold perspective. I think the rents are still relatively similar. There's like very little uh, discrepancy in terms yeah. of neighborhoods. As long as you're in the downtown core, you're getting kind of like similar, similar rental rates. Yeah, no, it's interesting though, because I know Matt McKeever's playing a similar game in London where he's looking at infrastructure and attractions like um, the factory in London and around Kellogg's there and just planning ahead and kind of taking a longer term approach to your investment strategy seems to be a great uh, like true and tried foundational practice so that you can anticipate that demand coming up and then obviously the price follows that so yeah I think, there, I think you kind of open yourself up to a little more risk when you're just trying to play a short-term game because yeah. it's one of those things well you're where, just betting on yeah and I have people ask me all the time I actually had one of my clients ask me this morning <laughs> Okay, we, we're just going firm on a property. Yeah. And he's like, I'm gonna rent it for two years. I kind of want to do the Airbnb thing, but maybe I'll just do a long-term rental. He has enough money so it ends up breaking even. So he's yeah. like, insert, instead of having that turnover or that risk or whatever, when should I sell this thing? And yeah. I'm like, quite honestly, if it's doing its job, don't. Like, don't. I'm being a bad salesperson yeah. because like that's I sell condos yeah uh, and I'm being a terrible salesperson but I'm also trying to look out for like truly his best interest yeah if it's serving its purpose and it's doing what you want it to do unless you find something else that is giving you a better return or yes. is significantly Another better asset don't like don't move it like, yeah. like don't touch it right for sure it, I think it's it's very difficult to especially as our market continues to appreciate, yeah. it's, it's getting harder and harder to find deals, right? And people two years ago were like, oh, there's no deals out there. And I'm sure you guys well, find it all the time like, as well. It's like, I hear this all the time and like, this is really my first time taking an investment look inside of Toronto. But if you just listen to the media or listen to the general um, consensus, is there's no deals in Toronto. There's no way to make money. It's all crazy, massive appreciation. You can potentially get lucky and ride that wave mm -hmm. uh, with a bit of risk, but it's good to hear that like a foundational practice such as betting on 
you know, future infrastructure and just the, the classics work here still. Yeah, they absolutely still do work here. There's some underserved uh, neighborhoods downtown, but I also think to a certain extent, like for end users, like the Burr strategy works well to yeah. sort of liquidate some money. Yeah. I mean, I did it here. I was, here's kind of a weird thing about condos downtown too. I find that very few people do rentals on their condos. Yeah. Which is weird because you're doing rentals in a smaller space and really all you can do it, is kind of like... It cost quite a bit less. It, it's lipstick and mask. Like you're not doing yeah. structural changes typically yeah. with a condo. It's typically paint, flooring, counters, backsplash. Yeah. So we're talking like in most circumstances less than 15 grand for a full overhaul I of your hope. condo, right? Yeah. So I oftentimes, and I think people kind of shy away from this because like, oh, it's, it's more money out of pocket and of course you need to have more money to invest downtown. Yes. But I think that that there's uh there is the opportunity to go and buy in good buildings and buy those beat up units yeah and a lot of people shy away from that and that's where i think the money is to be made for end users is yeah. go in there make you know buy it a little bit less than market value buy those things that have been sitting on the market for you know call it a little while here maybe 20 days yeah um <clears throat> put some cash into it and then end up doing the refi next year or whatever. But yeah. you know, there are some arbitrage opportunities for end users here still, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but I think that a lot of people and a lot of you know first time buyers want the shiny, you know, looks beautiful it, right now. And I think it's that- It's very easy to get stuck into that idea, right? The turnkey thought. Yeah. But I mean, when I look around here, it's all very simple elements. I mean, the flooring's like $3 a square foot. Yeah. There's only 700 square feet, it's 2,100 bucks. Yeah. If you can install it yourself, that's easy money. Yeah. You know, countertops are a few hundred bucks. Like the cover, it's probably came decently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean- Like that, or, you know, even to replace it's a small kitchen, guys. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's Honestly, nothing to make I would, this look I would, beautiful. In most circumstances, is I know like Matt thinks like this as well keep what you can don't change yeah. it if you don't need to make yeah. it look as pretty as it can get like I would very rarely I can't even think of a time that I've told someone rip out your cabinetry yeah like, oh well it looks ugly yeah well paint. it looks ugly but <laughs> paint it and change yeah. the handles it makes Hardware. all the difference in the world right but I, I find a lot of people shy away from that and I actually think in the Toronto condo market like that is kind of a strategy that very few people use that a lot more people need to be yeah. So, I mean, from right here where we are, we're basically downtown, but it's not the downtown core to the real, you know, hard, hardcore, hardcore <laughs> Torontonian. Yeah, yeah. But uh, who's going to rent this in terms of, you know, it, what's your fallback plan? So, I mean, an Airbnb renter, who, who does that look like? Yeah. And then who is your backup plan if, say, Airbnb, for whatever reason, yeah. stops working or doesn't work here? Yeah. So, Airbnb, in, my, like, in this particular location of Fort York, um, we're kind of situated on the southwest portion of downtown so we're kind of between like ontario like no ontario place yeah budweiser stage now but ontario place they do a lot of concerts there um we're right near porter which is a small airport downtown so they nice. they do a lot of flights within kind of like a three hour radius type yeah. of thing and then we're probably about a 15 minute walk to the roger center 20 25 minute walk to I'm, just, I'm gonna call it the ACC. It's the ACC, <laughs> yeah, guys. Come ACC. on, get over. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not changing the name on that. I'm just gonna call it the ACC. Um, so you're looking at concert goers. You're looking at sports fans. You're looking at professionals who travel for short yeah. distances. You're looking at flight crews. Um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I mean, I've had three Airbnbs myself. Having two days vacant downtown, kind of like anywhere, is pretty like that that would be normal to have anything more than two days wow i'm talking i went six months with no vacancies downtown because there always happens to be there's there's usually something going on downtown whether it's a game whether it's a concert whether it's carabana yeah or, there's always something going on in the city to to draw people here from wherever they're coming from you know that sounds great because when i think about it you know it's a really large investment and you're clearly putting in a lot of money for what you could get similar returns to in terms of cash flow in any other market for quite a bit less yep. money yeah um, but just knowing that you've got that demand all the time and something like an airbnb that you can push up your price per night to yeah to i mean count on it rely in on this it building huge. the highest i've seen was caravan a weekend someone rented for like 1250 a night nice so we're talking yeah. you know you're making half of what you think you're gonna get in gross rents in one evening so yeah. there are definitely the months especially summer months my place here renting 350 to 400 bucks a night every weekend is 
and definitely not out of the question. I just try and be conservative with my numbers because you're gonna get those. You're gonna get the you're gonna get the Novembers and you're gonna get the Februarys that yeah. are a little bit slower. Uh, but quite honestly, every other month has been Airbnb is pretty good now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, the neat thing is too, you can make this bet on a neighborhood that's on the come up. And there's still so much demand in this general area that like you're feeling all that upward pressure from everywhere else. So if you yeah. price yourself anywhere near those guys that are that 700 meters closer, right? Yeah. It's just so easy to I mean, fill. it's it's funny because like you said, hardcore Torontonians will be like, no, well, Fort York is in the downtown core, but yeah. like, it's not in the true core of downtown, but right? But probably they're not the ones staying here too, right? So no, well, that's what makes I mean, in terms of long-term Airbnb. stay, if you look at, Toronto's a very young city, right? Yeah. Um, we actually had, I don't know the exact statistics, but we have the most tech jobs that have been created in any of the major cities. So LA, New York, or Silicon wow. Valley. Toronto, in the last year, we've had the most tech created jobs of wow. anywhere in North America. Um, so if I was gonna rent this, and I do, I mean, I don't do leases, but I'll lease for my clients who purchase for investment kind of thing. Yeah. Um, young professionals, you're, you're gonna get a young professional. If you're living in this neighborhood, yeah. it's young professionals who typically have relatively high income. Yeah. Great, like, great credit. I just rented a place in the building over there, 1950 a month, which is actually a yeah. little bit low. Yeah. But we had 30 showings on the first day and wow. four offers. Wow. for a rental property, right? Um, and I'm talking like the the tenant that we ended up going with was just shy of 100K in income. Yeah. Almost 800 credit score. Perfect. Written letters from her landlord saying like how great she was. Yeah. Right? Like you want to talk about tenant quality? Yeah. You're going to get very, very high tenant quality. Yeah. Uh, in downtown. Like you, the rental market is one of the hottest rental markets in the world. Like the, that's sort of like the trade-off. You can get better cash flow and whatnot in London, yes. but you know there's going to be a bigger discrepancy in terms of tenant quality. Where here, your cash flow is not going to be as great, but pff, straight across the board, like AAA tenants all day long. Well, that definitely makes me feel a little bit better about Toronto. It sounds like you put some it's, thought into it. It's scary when you come from the outside <laughs> world, right? But uh, when you it's like when you're here, it's you like find Toronto the exists inside this crazy sphere. I don't want to call it a bubble because that sounds like hype, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like the sphere, and then the rest of the world is outside of Toronto. And yeah, I it's mean, it's just interesting to come in and see like. You know, there's investors here that are actually taking an objective approach to working the numbers out, making smart investment decisions based on the facts and based on empirical figures that you can kind of work off of instead of just betting. Uh, and that's kind of what it looks like from the outside, right? It looks like, you know, holy shit, everybody's just buying and hoping. Yeah, I mean, there but, is a lot of speculation around the market as well. Yeah. Um, I'm happy because over the last, I, there, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster ride over the last, you know, four-ish years that I've been in real estate. So I was there when it was like a little bit slower, and then I was there through the, like the absolute the crazy, peak where yeah. you, we're talking like if I saw ten offers, that would be considered a little low. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and people paying, people paying ridiculous prices just because they're like, oh, by the time I close, it'll be at that level. It'll be right? worth. <laughs> um, yeah. Which. Is, that's a scary. Don't do it that way. That's a scary <laughs> game. Don't do play. it that way. I think that like, it seems like there's no opportunities, but when you're working with someone who's in the market and knows the market, yeah. like there are opportunities to be found for sure. And I think that's true of any market. Like it doesn't matter what market you're in and watching this. There's opportunities in your market. You just have to know what you're looking for, um, and stay true to those principles that make sense, right? Instead of just just betting on something. So thanks for the chat. Really appreciate you filling me in on Toronto and it's now really exciting to hear. Yeah, now I know. <laughs> Thanks guys for watching though and I'm sure Matt's got some really cool links for you to follow. Click through those videos, subscribe, like it, share it, do whatever you gotta do to get it done. Awesome. See you guys. Thanks guys.